say money exists simply as a bookkeeping entry at a bank. And then in a more erudite pu uh, publication called the Federal Reserve today, they say to you, and then here they lay it out very plainly, they say if a bank makes a loan, it credits the checking account of the borrower, this creates new money in the form of additional check checkable deposits for the borrower, and that's it. Now it sounds on the face of it like a win-win situation. You get your loan, nobody coerced you to ask you for your loan, the bank is going to get interest in fees. What's the problem? Go to the next slide, please. The problem is that when money is created out of nothing, it depreciates the purchasing power of money that exists. And more importantly, it depreciates the purchasing power of money that's been promised for future payment. Think your pensions, think any annuities you have, think of the insurance that you have. And this really, in effect, represents stolen labor. So when you go to work and you get paid, that payment is really in exchange for your labor. If the money depreciates, in effect, you've lost your labor. Now, you can see this fall off. This is, this is official data, by the way, from the Federal Reserve. You see the fall off was kind of steep up until the early 1980s. And then it sort of like slowed down. And that slowed down, and I'll show you in just a moment how that happened. That's really the result of dishonesty on the part of the government. You can go to the next slide. There's a guy who's a scholar for me uh, for the Foundation for Advancement of Money Educa Monetary Education. It's, he's called John Williams. He was establishment economist in his uh, earlier career, his retirement now, with clients like Boeing and IBM. Uh, he rents a, a, a website, it's called shadowstats.com. And one of the things he's pointed out is that in the 1980s, the Bureau of Labor Statistics modified the methodology, the method by which they calculate the uh, CPI. And so the top line represents the CPI, this blue line represents the CPI using a consistent methodology. The bottom line, the red line, represents the CPI as the BLS puts forth with all these changes. These changes include things like geometric weighting, uh, 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 substitution, uh, hedonic pricing, stuff that nobody can understand. But the result is that they fool people into thinking that there's less depreciation of the money than there really is. So all through the uh, 1980s, 1990s, according to the Federal Reserve, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, inflation was running 1-2%. But truly, it was running six, seven, eight, as high as 12%. And this comes home almost every day, every time someone goes to the store. But in addition to the retail prices, next slide, please, this shows the year on year prices of some uh, common commodities uh, uh, a year ago today. And so you have things like corn oil uh, up 30%, uh, butter up 29%. I'm not going to go through the whole list. Fuel oil up 24%. These are double, di double digit increases in prices. And every time you go to the store, you see an increase in price. You go to slide 10, please. And there's other stuff. The antimony cotton, 53%, omni feet, 46%. We're not talking about no inflation. We're talking about double digit inflation in almost everything you can, you can buy. And slide 11, please. And just recently, uh, this week, in fact, uh, Bernanke, uh, uh, the chairman of the Board of Governors, the Federal Reserve, he was giving a talk, he says, the United States inflation is too low. So now they want to do what they call inflation targeting. They want to tell you right out how to depreciate your money. So one of the things, I'm, I'm single, I, I live in New York now. Go oh, to slide 12, please. And I buy a lot, a lot of common stuff off the internet. If it doesn't spoil, I stock up. And this is some of the stuff that I buy. And it just so happens I bought it last January, and I bought it this January as well. It's common things that everybody uses. Well, soap, shampoo, blades, shaving cream, toilet paper, a tie. Go to the next slide. These are the year-on-year -year increases in these common stuff. So toilet paper up 5%, tie detergents up 11%, shampoos up 14%, all the way up to the razor blades up 80%. And these are not labor-intensive products. These are machine-intensive products, pretty much. And so this notion that, uh, that inflation is benign, that is a, flat, a flat-out lie. Go to slide number 14. And the result is that they're cheating. They're cheating seniors that have Social Security benefits, who's uh, supposed to get an increment tied to the CPI. They're cheating to save the veterans whose benefits are also tied to the CPI. Same thing for union employees, cost of living increases. And of course, people who have treasury inflation bonds. And another result, go to slide 15, as the money started to depreciate, the savings rate in our country pretty much collapsed. Why save a depreciating asset? And of course, if you don't have savings, how are you going to make productive investments? 
go to slide 16. And also, one of the really big negatives on this is that since you had money greater than of nothing, now the federal government is but entering into all kinds of increased debt. And so you see, up until 1971, the debt levels of this country were kind of small. But after the last tie to gold was broken, the debt increased. I mean, greatly. And right now, the, the book debt is something like $14 trillion, not counting the additional $6 trillion the government took on when they took over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now, the reason I call this fraudulent debt is because this debt is being entered into with neither the intention nor the ability to ever repay it. And if anybody was to borrow money from you with neither the intention nor the ability to repay that debt, that's a prime cash fraudulent transaction. Go to slide 17, and this shows the year on year increase in debt. Again, as you can see, debt uh, was hardly increasing at all until the last time the gold was broken, the F was broken, the debt levels in this country took off. That big bar on the right hand side in 2009, that's at the end of the chart. That's an increase in debt. And go to slide 18. The same thing on the private side. So again, after the last time the gold is broken, this is the book, not the contingent debt, nothing to do with the promises. It, it went from a fairly low level in the 1970s. Today, it's something like $52 trillion, $53 trillion. This data, by the way, folks, comes from the uh, Federal Reserve. It's their flow of funds report. Now, how much will be defaulted? The answer is, as you'll realize in just a while, all of it's going to be defaulted. And what is the collateral of this debt? Well, these days, it's mostly real estate, residential real estate, commercial real estate. However, you can see, I think it's probably, uh, as the dollar depreciates, in effect, uh, this debt will be satisfied with worthless money. Go to slide 19. <clears throat> and also, in terms of the government fiscal position, the government started running enormous deficits after the last fight to gold was broken. You see, we had a fairly balanced budget up until 1971. But after 1971, now you're starting to get tremendous deficits. This is on a cash basis. On an accrual basis, it's like three, four trillion dollars a year. Now this next chart, number 20, this is something you'll never see in the major media because when they talk about US government debt, they talk about it as a percentage of, of GDP. GDP is a fucking number. Uh, it's, in, it's inflated because the inflation rate is understated but put the deficit as a percentage of receipts. It's running close to something like 70%. Now suppose you make $100,000 a year and you spend $170,000 a year. How long do you suppose you're gonna get away with that? And what is the self-correcting mechanism? Well, since there's no, uh, no real money, it's all this irredeemable paper ticket money, there is no self-correcting mechanism. And so like lemmings, they're all going over a cliff. Go to slide, the next slide, please. And how is it going forward? Well, this data comes from the Congressional Budget Office, and they are projecting almost trillion dollar budgets, excuse me, trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. Where's all the money going to come to fund these deficits? Well, they can't raise taxes that much. Again, they're going to create the money out of nothing. Go to slide 22. And this is the cumulative increase. So in the next eight years, they're going to increase that uh, to something like, uh, well, it's even forgetting about the Fannie Mae. I think it's something like 25, 26 trillion dollars. This is un un unsustainable. You're gonna have a, a complete bust in slide 23. And who are the real casualties here? The real casualties are businesses closing their doors and unemployment. These are the jobs that the Bureau of Labor Statistics says was lost since 2008. It's actually uh, uh, much more than that. They don't count everything. No time to go into that today. And slide 24. And here's the US balance of trade. Again, all of these big negative effects happened in the United States after the last time gold was broken. So, what I want you to take away from this is that gold was really the stabilizing force that kept, that kept the deficit in track, that kept debt in track, that kept leverage in track. Go to slide 25, please. Look what happened to unemployment. So, you always had some unemployment in the United States, but after the last time to gold was broken, today, the official numbers is that you have something like 15, 16 million people unemployed. I mean, this last report that came out where they said the unemployment rate dropped to something like, uh, it went from 9.8% to 9.1%, that includes a seasonal adjustment. If you back out the seasonal adjustment, the number of unemployed went up. And not only is the number of unemployed go up, go to slide 26, 
Look what happened to duration. People unemployed. So it used to be you know, maybe four or five weeks. Today it's something like 26 weeks. And not only that, but it's 27. This country used to be the powerhouse of manufacturing. I mean, the reason we won World War II, according to a lot of people, the United States was considered the arsenal of, the arsenal of democracy. And look what happened to manufacturing employment in the United States after we broke OPEC's tie to gold. And you peaked that at something like 19 million today, it's something like 12 million. The guys on the other side of this argument say, well, there's been a lot of automation. Well, it's true, but about 50,000 factories plus closed, and a great deal of that automation has moved to the Oregon, it's moved to China. And so all the iPads, uh, iPods that you get from Apple computer, they're not made in America, they're made in China. And the next slide, and so this last slide, uh, I showed the drop off in manufacturing and employment, that understates the fact because we've had big increases in population. So again, you go back to the early, probably 24% of the uh, civilian labor force was making things. Today it's less than 8%. Slide 29, please. And look what happened to state and local taxes after you broke the last tie to gold. I mean, the whole thing just took off. And a big component of state taxes are property taxes. Next slide, please. So today they're collecting something like 400 plus billion dollars in property taxes. Property taxes are a real drag on people who are retired, people who have fixed income. And today we have something like 80 million baby boomers who are about to retire. A lot of these folks are gonna be forced out of their homes. But it also has a very detrimental effect on the productive capacity of this country. And the best illustration of that is a story which appeared in the New York Times a couple of years ago, slide 31. This is a guy who had a machine intensive product in Cary, uh, Illinois. And the, the tagline, this is a quote from the story, this is Douglas Barlow recently closed his printed circuit board factory uh, because the property taxes were no longer affordable. So in other words, this is not a, this is not a labor intensive uh, uh, See, the, the machines in the background, you can't compete with China because they don't have property taxes that he has. So what's his solution for this? Next slide. He says, I'm going to tear down the building and sit on the land and hope to sell it after the recession when prices hopefully rise. I mean, isn't this, isn't this a crime? I mean, isn't this outrageous? Well, somebody must benefit from this. Go to slide three, please. And the principal beneficiaries are Wall Street. And I'm just giving an example of the banks. So look what happened to bank revenues after the last tie to gold was broken. I mean, they went into the stratosphere. And you should know also that roughly half the bank revenues go to compensation. Size so 34, and this is their net income. And this is, this by the way, they, they peaked at it something like $130 million in net income. Just to give you a, a reference point, the car industry well, uh, at one point, was doing something like 130, 120 million, 100 billion dollars. But from the car industry, we got 20 million cars. What do we get from the banks? I mean, cancel checks and bank statements. Let's go to slide 35, and this is their cumulative net income, something like one and a half trillion dollars. And the bulk of that, I'd say, roughly 90 percent of that came after the last tide. The gold was broken. Go to the next slide, and they paid out something like a trillion dollars in dividends. Now those dividends that they paid out, by the way, uh, that wasn't money that was really earned, which is, uh, I mean, not only was it just you know, keyed into a computer, but it wasn't you know, real money, but they bought real stuff with it. And I'll show you about that in just a minute. Um, just recently, the last few years, we had to bail out the banks, again, with money created nothing to the tune of a couple of trillion dollars. Nobody in this room got a bill from the government to bail out the bank. Where'd they get the money? The answer is they created it out of nothing, depreciating the purchase power of money that you've saved, money that you're earning, but they understate the depreciation of much more quickly. They depreciate the purchasing power of your future payments, your pension. And if you want to see a, a, a really shocking slide, go to the next one. This is how it's worked out for these folks from the years 1980 to 2007. So if you go back to 1980, the money supply in this country was roughly $2 trillion the stock market capital was something like a trillion dollars, and the financial sector component of that was 5%. You can't hardly even see the amount of money, the amount of capitalization in the financial sector on that left-hand side. And it's, it's almost unseeable. And then you zip ahead to 2007, and now the money supply has grown flat out of nothing, just created by tapping numbers into a computer to $13 trillion. The market of his residences in Greenwich Connect 
Connecticut. It looks like a hotel. These folks are buying uh, 400 foot boats, $200 million airplanes, outfitting these airplanes with hot tubs and saunas on the plane. Can you imagine a drone plane with a hot tub and a sauna on the plane? And a couple of years ago, next slide, these five bankers, they got dinner and they spent $62,000 for dinner. I mean, what do you eat for $62,000? I mean, it turns out there were four bottles. The next one. Turns out there were four bottles of wine on the, uh, they had $15,000 a bottle. What are these restaurants even doing stocking $15,000 bottles of wine? And what is it that these people produce that, that, that society should reward them like that? And the answer is absolutely nothing. They have the special privilege of creating money flat out of nothing, which is, again, and you'll see later in the second part of this presentation, it is unlawful and the whole thing is dishonest. Now, if you think $62,000 for a tenant is outrageous, go to the next slide. I don't want to tell anybody's uh, sensibilities about it, but this is a, a picture of a Coke bottle which sold recently for $35 million. I mean, un unbelievable. They're going to know what they're doing, buddy. And the next slide, if you think that's weird, this, this is a picture that uh, Andy Warhol made. It's a picture of dollar bills. It's just a picture. It sold for $43 million. Uh, slide 43. Now, I want to say a little bit about the structure of the banking system and how the folks in the banking system are gambling with your savings and your promises of future payment. Now, the way the system works is that we, in fact, by law, by law, guarantee the balance sheets of the banks. So the balance, and we're talking about the big banks, not the little banks. So somehow the big banks, you know, uh, make bad bets and whatnot. Uh, we have to come to their rescue. The metaphor that I like is, suppose I tell you folks, look, we're all going to play poker, and here's how we play the game. If you win, you keep your winnings. If you lose, the taxpayers will give you more money. Well, who wouldn't play any game like that? And what's to stop you from making crazy bets? And the answer is regulation. So the regulators stand up to your shoulder and say, look, pulling to an inside straight against three showing, that's a crazy bet, don't do it. So what do the banks do? They make off-table bets. Think special investment vehicles. Think derivative. Go to the next slide. And so this organization in the world that's called the Bank of International Settlements was formed after World War I to facilitate the reparations payment in Germany to the Allies. This Bank of International Settlements is sort of like an umbrella group, central banks. It has sovereignty. Sovereignty, which means none of their records can be subpoenaed, can be looked at. But one of the things they do is they, uh, they uh, 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 calculate the outstanding derivatives, all the recording banks. The last uh, time I have data for was December 2009. The banks worldwide have made 615 trillion, with a T, 615, $615 trillion worth of derivative bets. Now, what is the business purpose of $600 trillion worth of bets? It's mostly foreign exchange and interest rate bets. And the answer is, there is no business purpose. All they're doing is gambling. And if they win those bets, they keep their money. If they lose those bets, you have to pay up. Again, they don't come to you for the cash. They just create money out of nothing to bail these guys and appreciate the purchasing power of money that you save and money that's due you. Well, how much can they lose? Well, they can't lose the whole $615 billion. This is the notional amount. But the Bank for International Settlements does us a favor, and they calculate the amount at risk on the next slide. And what they tell us is that the amount at risk is $34 trillion. Now, who can take a $34 trillion hit? And why are we guaranteeing the balance sheets of the banks? Why are we subsidizing them? I'm going to leave that for another time. The wake-up call that people got, the next slide, please, was when we had this downturn in the markets 2008, 2009, and the Dow Jones uh, Industrial Average collapsed from something like uh, 12,000 to something like 6,500. This was a real wake-up call for a lot of people. And one of the reasons, again, is that you have all these baby boomers about to retire, and the next thing you know, their IRAs, their 401ks, their KEO plans, everything they got is in half, and their real estate is collapsing as well. And there was real fear, and they should have been fear. And on a worldwide basis, go to slide 47, uh, Blumberg calculates the equity values of all of the markets worldwide, and at their peak, they peaked at it something like $62 trillion, and at its uh, nadir, it dropped down to $27 trillion. $35 trillion downturn in the market value, people savings, think the savings are safe, um, not counting real estate. Go to slide 48. So, how is the best way to protect yourself? The most efficient way to protect yourself, go to 49, please, is with gold. 
And so since 2001, gold has appreciated almost double digits every year here in the United States against the dollar. No down years. Now given what's happened in the market in the last several years, if Wall Street had a pop, any kind of mutual fund or whatnot, that increased average 18% a year over the last 10 years, no down years, don't you think you'd be hearing about it? Don't you think they'd have you stuffing your pension funds with this stuff? How come you don't hear anything good about gold? And the answer is, Wall Street is a fee business. They're in it for the fees. And if you buy gold, they don't get any more fees. So they tell you it's volatile, or it's risky, you can't eat it. So they have all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't get it. The fact of the matter is, this is the most efficient way to protect yourself on the next slide. And it's not just in the United States. So this shows the same appreciation of the major currencies around the world. Uh, some of these currencies had very minor downturns in, in a couple of these years. But on average, it's up double digits for every country. To the United States, the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, the Chinese yen, the euro, uh, the rupee, the yen, the Swiss franc, and the pound. We'll go to the next slide. And every year, again, it appreciates. And the next slide, so this volatility issue, every, every price is a ratio. And if you look at the, I want to say about this in just a moment, I'm almost done, folks. The stability of gold versus the stability of money supply, this shows the change in year on year on the money supply versus gold. You see, gold is, is on its level, it's, it's constant. It's gold that's stable, it's the so called dollar which is unstable. And the real way to look at this, again, all prices ratio, is not to look at gold in dollars, but to look at dollars in terms of gold. We'll go to the next slide. This shows the price of the dollar uh, measured in a thousand thousand of gold. And as you can see, it's a straight line down. Ask yourself, is there anything in the cards that's going to make gold more valuable, uh, excuse me, it's going to make the dollar more valuable than gold? And the answer is not, not a thing. All you can look forward to going public is not just in America, but all over the world countries creating money flat out of nothing. And the, 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 the tragedy of it is that virtually nobody in America is protected. Go to the next slide. This shows the, this was put together by a guy named Sean McGuire, who works for the Texas Retirement System. He made this presentation at the London Bullion Market Association a couple of months ago. It shows the amount of gold that's allocated to pensions in the United States. It's 0.1, I can't even read the little rough here. Um, it's 0.15% uh, out of roughly 11, 12 trillion dollars in pension funds, about 17 billion dollars. Everybody is taking in the United States. They have no protection. And go to the next slide, two from the last. Uh, this is data together by the McKinsey uh, Company. It shows the financial assets worldwide. And as of uh, the latest year they have it, which is uh, 2009, it was roughly $190 trillion in financial assets. That tiny little red thing at the very top, it's $3 trillion, that's gold. All the rest is in irredeemable paper ticket money, and all of that stuff is melting away. And finally, and this is a line from the American Federation of Labor, uh, 1896. Gold, they said, still is the stamp of every great civilization, not the gold standard, but gold itself. And the reason it's true is because gold protects future payments. That's the most important thing in society. All, all the relationships we have are the promises that we made to one another. And the key promise, except for the ones we make to our families, is the promise to pay. And if the promise is to pay break down, the entire web of interrelationships uh, in society break down. Gold prevents that breaking down. And my very, very last slide, uh, I ask people to join the fight for office money. I want to commend everybody in South Carolina for coming to this conference and uh, for pushing forth legislation to help remedy very people paper ticket money. And I want to thank you all so very much for your time. And I'll see you later in the evening. And thank you, God bless. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could you give us a, just a brief uh, introduction to the part two of this later? What are you going to be talking about in part two of your presentation? Part two, I'm going to focus primarily on the dishonesty in the system. And I'm also going to have something in the, in the beginning where I'm going to show you that it's not in conformity with the rule of law. It's not in conformity with the Constitution. This business about dishonesty is very important.
when you find something is dishonest, you must step aside. So there was a time a few years ago when uh, stocks of company like Enron and Qualcomm and whatnot were soaring. A lot of people, especially in the investment world, had doubts about this, but they went in anyway because it kept going up. And along the way, uh, and even with the naysayers, it kept going up, and they would say, well, look, if I listened to you, I'd miss the run. Well, once the dishonesty gets discovered,